Let us pray. Almighty God, we're truly thankful that we can come together at this particular time during the week that we might worship you, sing songs of praise, offer our prayers unto you, and to learn more from your holy word. There are so many individuals we know of in this congregation, in our own families that are that are on our hearts for various reasons. So we pray for them and we pray that we continue to reach out to them in the ways that we do so that they know that we care about them and that indeed you care about them too. Because we have confidence in you and we trust you that you will indeed work things out for our our, our best. We pray for the world in which we live because there seems so much chaos in our own country, in other places, so much animosity. And we pray that we'll just listen to each other, love each other, try to understand each other. Most of all, be able to tell each other about you because you are our hope and our promise in this life and in the life to come. Father, we pray that you will help us when we sin and fall short of what you would have us to do, that we will make those changes in our lives. It's never too late to come closer to you and to begin each and every day saying, Lord, help us to be the best that we can be today, to further your kingdom, to show your love. And as we go to our classes, we pray that we will continue to grow in wisdom and understanding that we recognize that the Word of God continues to live in our hearts. And each time that we look into your Word, we not only have our faith reinforced, but we learn new things about your love and your regard for us. So, Father, be with us now, then, as we go to our classes. Help us to always be your children and to reflect you in ways that people see your Son shine forth in us. And we look forward to a heavenly home when your Son comes back. In Jesus' name, amen. Please mark number 763. Song of invitation tonight, number 763. Four classes, we'll sing number 826. Sing the first and last verse, number 826. <clears throat> When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will be.
Tonight will be the last night that I will uh, try to do uh, some of the archaeological finds uh, that are available to us to kind of help us to uh, understand a little bit more about the Bible, about the historical times of the Bible, uh, but also kind of help us to have things to say to people whenever they say, well, you know, the Bible is just a myth. Uh, nothing like that could have happened or anything like that. Uh, but it is a historical book, and the things that it teaches, the things that it says happened, uh, did happen. And we're going to see some of those things today, or to, uh, you know, tonight, as far as um, some credence to the things that are there. Now, uh, next week, uh, Marty will be teaching. Uh, Sarah and I will be in Gulf Shores, and uh, Don is preaching Sunday morning. And uh, so remember that. And I hope that um, what I've done with what we're doing with the archaeological uh, finds and things is at least let you know that they're there and you can research and maybe, you know, you can go to some of these sites that brings up new ones that are found every year and, and um, you know, you'll find some things that are interesting to you uh, that will help, help build your faith uh, in the Bible. We're going to start with Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And uh, children of Israel have been in uh, Babylonian captivity now for 70 years. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian king who um, oh, conquered them. Nabonidus, I think, was the last Babylonian king, and then Cyrus came in and overcame Babylon, won, you know, won them, uh, which that's another one of those uh, things that's, that's really um, interesting as to how, you know, they, won, they conquered Babylon. But anyway, it says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Now that's the way Ezra records what happened. Um, and a lot of people have said through time that that would not be something a Persian king would do. That just has to be fantasy or whatever. You all have seen this several times before. I've shown it before. But uh, this is called the Cyrus Cylinder. And... Um, from the British Museum, where I'm pretty sure it's at at this point in time, uh, they say it's at a Babylonian account of the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus in 539 BC. Recognize that as this is actually by Cyrus the Great. Of his restoration to various temples of statues removed by Nabonidus, the previous king of Babylon, and of his own work at Babylon. That's a part of what it's, what it's about. They go on to say, the people of neighboring countries brought tribute to Babylon, and Cyrus claims to have restored their temples and religious cults, and to have returned their previously deported gods and people. 
So here we find something dug up out of the ground, as Don Smythe would say, um, that is history. It's Cyrus himself saying, this is how I treated the people that uh, I conquered, or, or when I took over Babylon, they had conquered. And so I allowed some of them to go back and uh, return their previously deported gods and told the people they could do that. Uh, I'm sure with Israel, uh, he would have said, okay, your God has let me do this. He's let me be king now. You know, you can go back and you can worship him the way that uh, Ezra has it uh, phrased or the Holy Spirit has Ezra to write it here within the scriptures. Um, but this is another uh, thing that has been found that uh, kind of proves whenever, you know, the Bible claims that something happened, um, it, it did happen. Okay. The next one, and uh, I hope I've got enough to last again this time, uh, the Mernepte steel, I suppose is what it is. And a steel is just a big rock that has uh, all types of uh, historical records and things like that, you know, engraved upon it. Of course, this would have been in uh, hieroglyphics. Uh, this is an Egyptian steel, and uh, it tells about Oh, uh, one of the pharaohs uh, going into Israel and conquering uh, at least some of the states there. And he will say concerning it, Israel wasted, bare of seed, Israel lies wasted, seed no longer exists. Uh, he also tells about some other lands that are, uh, or nations or whatever that are next to Israel. And I think his primary goal was more in the... Um, the Philistine area is where he really went in order to, you know, to fight and everything. But Israel was kind of uh, one of those things of, uh, well, it's in my way or it's on my way or whatever. Let's go in and, and see what we can do. Now, what it has, um, it, its best value as far as history is concerned, it's gained much fame and notoriety for being the only ancient Egyptian document generally accepted as me, uh, mentioning Israel. Uh, in other words, uh, you don't find Israel's name necessarily in uh, Egypt other than on this particular document. doesn't mean there aren't others there. It's just they haven't been found at this point in time. And so, uh, but it, it's also, it says, by far the earliest known attestation, attestation of Israel. Um, in other words, this is the first time that um, anything in antiquities mentions Israel as a nation. You know, Israel as being in their homeland and, and being a, a nation or anything like that. Uh, Craig, did, they, yeah. if you, did you read a date? Uh, a on, date as yeah. far as this is concerned. Yeah. That is one of those things you'll have to research, Don. And, <laughs> you know, I should have. I, I'm glad you asked that. I should have done it. And, and uh, I used most of the time I said, well, it's during this time. It's during that time. Uh, Sarah, look it up for me, if you will. My, my secretary is looking it up for me. <laughs> 1213, 1203. BCE. Oh, okay, 1203, somewhere or about. Um, BCE is be, before Common Era. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. It's, it's, uh, uh, so it, it's 1203, you know, 45. BCE. Yeah. Now that, now that y'all got that, if I'm not mistaken, it was during the time of the judges. Is whenever this, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, you know, that's what it said. It was during the time of the judges uh, that this particular steel was uh, oh, written or engraved or, or whatever. Good question. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked. And a good answer. Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad we got smartphones now. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Okay. Here's the next one, and that I just put that up there. That, that's not right. Um, this is a steel. I'm going to call it the Hoffer steel. Okay, the Hoffer steel. Now, um, this one was actually found, I think, in 19, uh, I mean, 2022, just last year. A farmer was 
plowing his field, getting it ready, and he found it. Uh, kind of like an arrowhead over here, I reckon. You know, it's it's uh, you know, found that and turned it in and, and uh, everything. Uh, it was known as a border steel, uh, probably kind of like a borderline of the Egyptian government at that point in time, whenever, whenever it was. Uh, but the thing about this one is uh, it mentions Hophra, and Hophra is mentioned within the scriptures uh, themselves, as we'll, we'll see here. Um, but it also tells uh, about, uh, oh, A, a type of a, a type of a battle, a type of a siege, or whatever, and some say it may have to do with um, the Egyptians coming in and helping uh, Israel or Judah during the time that Babylon was going to attack them. Um, that it, there's a good possibility of it. That um, that's you know exactly what it what it was talking about. Uh, the passages that we might look at, thus says the Lord, behold, I will give you Pharaoh, Hopper, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, into the hand of those who seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who was his enemy and sought his life. So Jeremiah was foretelling that even though Hopper came up to help, um, oh, to help Judah, he was going to be captured by Babylon as well. Uh, another one is uh, Ezekiel 17, 15 through 18. Uh, Hophra is the Pharaoh whom King Zedekiah allied with against Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and that's what provoked him to do that. And that comes from the armstronginstitute.org. But uh, once again, he's still indicating that here's this... Um, this Pharaoh that is named within Scripture, and this Pharaoh exists. Uh, here's this Pharaoh that is named within Scripture that uh, came up to help Judah, and um, here's something that could easily be his record of that happening. You know, they don't, they don't know for sure. They've still got a, a lot to do as far as um, since it was just. 2022 that it was found. Uh, they've still got a lot to do as far as uh, deciphering it and, and figuring out exactly what it's, what all it's talking about. Anyone? Okay. Let's go to this one. The Moabite stone. Um, the Moabite stone was one that was um, found at a marketplace over there somewhere or the other. And uh, anyway, they wound up breaking it in two and kind of selling off the pieces to make more money out of it. Uh, somebody had gone in and they had made a, a rubbing, I guess, of it before they did that. And they finally found it all. And they got it back together and put it back together. But uh, it is a story of uh, Mesha, the king of Moab, uh, who claims that uh, Omri, the king of uh, Israel, which was Ahab's father, and then he'll go on to say, Omri was the king of Israel. He oppressed Moab for many days. For Chemos, which was Chemosh in, in our scriptures, uh, C-H-E-M-O-S-H, -E and that was the Moabite god, was angry with his land, and his son succeeded him, that is, Omri's son, um, now, most figure that that's um, old Jehoash. Pretty sure it is Ahab's son is who he's talking about. Uh, his son succeeded him, and he said, He too, I will oppress Moab. In my days he did so, but I looked down on him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin, yet it has gone to ruin forever. Um, 2 Kings 3, 4, and 5. Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder. He had to deliver the king Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Um, let's see if I've got anything on that. 
No, I've got I've got things on the other one. Uh, that's that's one that's been around for a while, the Moabite stone, uh, but it is uh, an enemy's account of uh, a war or a time of war uh, between uh, Israel and uh, Moab, and so very interesting in that, uh, in that it mentions both uh, old Omri, uh, it mentions Mesha. It mentions Chemosh and all the different things that uh, are mentioned within the Bible. Anyone? Okay, let's go to this one. The Lashish letters. Now, the Lashish letters are written on clay, kind of like clay pots or something along that line, and they found them uh, in this town of Lachish in, in the digs or whatever. Um, they seem to be more of like a commander either writing to his commander in Jerusalem or perhaps um, you know him receiving letters uh, among them. Um, the Whoever the person was writing to this individual uh, kind of degraded him. It, it's kind of like he said, can't you read letters? I don't even think you can read. Apparently he misread something or or something along that line. But uh, anyway, uh, there were two towns uh, that were left as far as uh, when Babylon was coming in. They were Lashish and um, Azekah. Ashish and Exeka. And um, both of these are named uh, within these letters that are given. Now, there's a lot of the letters that are just simply um, military lists of, of uh, soldiers and supplies and things like that. But some of them are, are pretty good uh, in that it says, To my Lord uh, Yeshush, may Yahweh... Calls my Lord to hear tidings of peace today, this very day. Uh, the commander of the army, Coniah, son of Elantan, uh, has gone down to go to Egypt, and he sent to uh, commander uh, Hodavia, son of Ahijah, and his men from here, and asked for the letter of Tobiah, the servant of the king, which came to Shalem, the son of Jehuiah, from the prophet, saying, Be on guard, your servant is sending it uh, to my Lord. So he is referring uh, to somebody going down in, into Egypt. Uh, he is referring to a prophet having sent letters uh, to, be, to beware. And uh, they think possibly that it could be a reference to Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 20 through 24. And let's uh, see what we've got there. Jeremiah chapter 26, uh, verses uh, 20 through 24. <laughs> there was another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Uriah, the son of Shemaiah from kareth Jerem. He prophesied against this city and against this land in words like those of Jeremiah. And when Je King Jehoiakim, with all his warriors and all the officials, heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard of it, he was afraid and fled and escaped to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent to Egypt certain men, Elnathan the son of Akabar and others with him, and they took Uriah from Egypt and brought him to King Jehoiakim, which struck him down with the sword and dumped his body into a burial place of the common people. So what we find there is that like Jeremiah, who was prophesying, you know, hey, you're going to lose this battle. You just well get ready for it. Uh, you're going to go to Babylon. You just well get ready for it. Um, this Uriah was doing just that. And when he found out that the king was after him, he went down to Egypt. And possibly this is the prophet who was saying, be on your guard. And uh, anyway, that's the reason the guys went down to Egypt. Uh, we don't really know that for sure. But they, they do pretty much date these uh, as being the time whenever um, Jerusalem was maybe not necessarily under siege by Babylon just yet, 
but they were coming down to lay siege to Babylon. And they still had the, the two cities out there, Lashish and Azekah. And um, let's look at Jeremiah 34, 7. Jeremiah 34, 7. We'll start with verse 6. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah king of Judah and Jerusalem when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, uh, Lashish and Azekah, for these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. So only three remained, Jerusalem, uh, Lashish, and uh, Azekah. And... Uh, one of the, one of the uh, letters has this inscription. Let's see. No, it wasn't an inscription. That was just, that it was just a statement made in biblicalarchaeology.org. Uh, basically what he said, however, the reference is not uh, to not being able to see Azekah is even more interesting at the time of the Babylonian invasion. Lashish and Azekah were the two strongest Judaite cities in the uh, Shephel uh, region and the last two cities besides Jerusalem to withstand the army of Nebuchadnezzar II. While some have interpreted this statement in a geographical sense, indicating that the letter sender was in a fortress that did not have a uh, clear line of sight to Azekah, others have seen it at a far more dramatic, dramatic site. As such, they interpret the text as a reference to the fall of Azekah to the Babylonians, placing the event in the days immediately preceding the fall of Lashish itself. So, uh, I did not put that up there. I wish I had. You know, on one of them, it talks about uh, Lashish and Azekah, and they were looking for the signal fires uh, from Azekah, and they couldn't see them. They couldn't you know, see anything about them. And uh, some say, well, that's just saying that they weren't in line, they couldn't see each other. But others are saying, well, they're saying it's gone. You know, Azekah's gone. And uh, we're next type thing. So it, it's pretty pretty interesting uh, in that you, know, you have something, once again, kind of backing up what the Bible says about Lashish and Azekah being the, the last two cities besides Jerusalem. Uh, you have the, uh, the people going to Egypt. You have a prophet involved saying, be on your guard. And, uh, you know, the use of Yahweh uh, in, the, in the inscriptions as well. Anyone? Craig? Yes. I want to say it, it still fascinates me how God's people in world history and to the world has always been insignificant to the time of Christ. Uh, and yet, we, God's book is by far the most complete historical document we have. Okay. Uh, there is more history about everything. Okay. You'll find within the pages of it than, than any other book. Okay. And then the idea of when they do find little things of history, as you say, it's right down the line uh, with exactly what the Bible says, thereby you know, proving mm -hmm. that the Bible was, was telling truth, uh, facts and statements. But the idea of, of, of it being ins insignificant to the time of Jesus, and then it grew and it grew, till as they, uh, uh, some of the others, uh, uh, the people, the antis uh, in, of Christ in, in the book, so it filled the whole world. Okay. You know, Jesus acted. And, and almost everybody knows the name of God and Jesus because they curse them, you know, use them as their curse words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that a lot here lately. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't remember as a kid growing up, everybody using Jesus' name as a curse word uh, or to curse or whatever, yeah. whatever reason they use it, you know. Uh, but they do that a lot. Okay. You know, now, too, but they've, they've always... Taking God's name in vain, okay. uh, especially since the time of Jesus. I guess uh, I don't know. You know, uh, historically, you know, maybe they took other gods 
names, that, but I don't know of anybody that uses Balaam as a curse word or, <laughs> or Baal or, or you know, yeah. any, uh, yeah. what are some the Hindu gods yeah. or anything. Yeah. They don't use them to curse, yeah. but it's always just an over God. That's okay. the one that the world has used since that time. But, I don't know, it's just something how insignificant it, it always was. God's people, okay. they wanted it that way. Okay. You got to see a few, and then to my son comes, and then I'm going to okay. blow the whole world up. I just need a few right here in this area to do what I need to do right now. Uh, I want them to be faithful, even if they're not faithful. I'm going to carry it out. We're going to get it done. Uh, but it's a good point, a real good point. Um, and even though they were insignificant in number and or the land uh, that they covered, um, they have the history there. Uh, that's just like with... Well, with uh, Moab, to my knowledge, about the only thing you know about Moab is um, just a few like that stone a while ago, and then what's in the Bible, you know. Which is and, a lot. Yeah. Uh, in the Bible. Yeah. But, but when they find that, like that stone, it agrees with what the Bible says. You know, it, it tells what the Bible says. And, of course, you've got to allow for enemies writing it from their point of view. It's kind of like the statement goes, um, as long as the lion writes the history, it'll always, he'll always be the hero. Uh, you know, well, that's, that's the way it is, you know. Uh, but the world could have cared less about God's people. I mean, they just yeah. didn't even count. Yeah, until, yeah, until after Christ. This book was yeah. recorded. And then after Christ, it, it went out. And now people care, but not in the sense of um, a lot of times I want to be a part of them. I just don't want them to tell me I'm doing wrong. You know, I'm just, I'm just okay. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. Um, the next one that I have here is uh, Ketif Hinnom Scrolls. Now, um, these are very small silver scrolls that were actually uh, amulets. Uh, one of the amulets is uh, one inch in height and uh, about a half inch uh, in, uh, or no, let's see, unrolled. It's th 3.8 inches in length and one inch in width. That's what it is. 3.8 inches in, in uh, length and, and one inch in width. And then the other one is uh, one and a half inches in length and about a half inch you know, in width. Um, it took them a long time to unroll these after they found them. I think it took like three or four years and these were found like in the early 80s, maybe it's 1979, but, but they finally did get them unrolled. Uh, they're made of like 97% pure shield, silver. Um, they were able to read some things off of them. They're, they're, they're just micro letters evidently they evidently they had a way of writing very small back then or whatever uh, but what the amulets say is uh, who keepeth covenant mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments coming from deuteronomy 7 9 and then also the lord bless thee and keep thee the lord make his face to shine upon thee um, it says there it is evident that the key tiff Hinnom scrolls uh, that choice passages were picked from a compilation of scriptures in existence during the 7th century BCE. Now, basically, the reason that these are important is because um, it's like we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before um, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the um, earliest manuscripts of Old Testament was more like 400 A.D., that they had. Um, once they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they could say, hey, we know that the Bible was in existence, the Old Testament was in existence 100 or 200 years before Jesus. We know that for sure now because we've got these. Well, these, um, a lot of people thought that uh, the, uh, the five, the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch was actually written after the Babylonian captivity. You know, a lot of people 
in today's society. Uh, well, the Pentateuch wasn't written by Moses. It was just you know, in, uh, after the Babylonian captivity. These were found, and about everybody that dates them and has anything to do with them or whatever, they say no, they were written back uh, before Babylon took over uh, in the first temple era. And so we know that Deuteronomy 7, 9, and Numbers 6, 24, and 25, at least, were ex in existence at that time. Uh, because here are these people that have written these, uh, put them in a tomb, uh, you know, maybe had them as a keepsake or whatever, and uh, they quoted these passages and put them on there. So these are, as far as I know, uh, the, the uh, oldest quotations from scriptures that have been found. Um, yeah. One of the things that was interesting, the second scroll contains about 100 words arranged in 12 lines of text. Thus, the person who inscribed the text was able to fit all of that onto a silver sheet the length of a matchstick. So that's writing pretty small, you know, but that's, that's what they can read it on that using the, the technology that they have now. Anyone? And then this ne next one, this last one very quickly, is Hezekiah's Tunnel. Uh, it's been known for a long time. Uh, some say Hezekiah, this is what, you know, whenever he dug it, uh, if you'll notice here, the passage that I have, this same Hezekiah closed the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them to the west side of the city of David. Uh, 2 Kings 20:20, 20, 20, the rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Uh, it's supposed to be a, uh, a tunnel that was dug and it brought the Gihon Spring, which is a bubbling spring and could have sustained about 2,500 people. Uh, the tunnel itself is 1,700, uh, 1,750 feet long. Uh, it went from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam, which is a man-made thing. And it was designed, and the reason Hezekiah did this is so that the enemy could not use that water. Um, they had it kind of enclosed within uh, uh, some walls or something along that line, but it would go through a part of Jerusalem and then on out and, and uh, you know, the enemy could have used the water after it passed on through Jerusalem. But uh, they made it to where that it was totally enclosed in Jerusalem and uh, they would have water in case the Babylonians or whoever it may have been, the Assyrians actually is who Hezekiah was fighting. Uh, would set up siege walls and try to keep them in there and make them starve to death or, or uh, you know, go thirsty or whatever. But uh, some say this is what Hezekiah built. Others, of course, you know, wanting to doubt the scriptures and things, they'll say, no, this was just something totally different. But uh, either way, it's uh, kind of a, an amazing thing uh, that they, they dug this. Um, I think it was at the Pool of Siloam they found a, uh, a tablet of some kind, a record of some time, kind that told of the digging. Uh, the men actually dug from both directions. Uh, it's not a straight one, it's kind of does this number, but why, that nobody really knows for sure. But they got to one another, they could hear one another, and uh, you know, the picks and everything uh, kind of going against one another. and. Uh, Finally, finally broke it through and, and met in the middle uh, and uh, was able to supply the water that was there. Anyone? I know I haven't been as versed on these as, as I thought I was, and I haven't, I haven't been as versed as maybe I have been on the others, but uh, you know, I hope that they're interesting. And like I say, I, I hope that you realize that, that things are continually being found. Uh, like the the steel in uh, 2022 that the farmer found in his field, and uh, and different things like that. And every time something is found, 
they'll look through it, you'll have your naysayers, you'll have your people saying, no, nah, I don't have anything. And then there's others that, man, it looks awful close to the Bible, or it looks awful close. And, you know, eventually it proves out that, yeah, it, it had to do with the, some of the things that the Bible teaches. Thank you. We'll start with something different. Um, let's see, I told you that Marty's teaching next week. Danny McCain, uh, we supported him in a uh, old, like a three-week campaign over in Eastern Europe, and uh, he's wanting to come the next Wednesday night to do a presentation concerning that. So that's, that's kind of what's happening, and then I'll start a, kind of a class uh, after that. I think we're probably probably all in. Proverbs chapter 23, starting with verse 1. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies. For he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. We find also a, a passage in... Um, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, where it says, Set your mind on things that are above and not on things of this earth. Now, both of these have to do with the idea of don't be uh, so caught up in the things of this world that um, they become who you are. Uh, they become maybe your God, but maybe not even your God. It's just, it's just something that you tend to judge yourself by and you judge other people by and uh, you want because you have this idea of uh, if I am high with a politician then uh, I can have things in this life or um, if I have a lot of stuff I can have things in this life 
We talk about this quite often. And the reason being, the Bible talks about it quite often. But what brought it to my mind tonight was uh, a thing that I read, a post that I read uh, on Facebook. Matthew Basford was a preacher of the gospel. Uh, he was struck with ALS very young. Uh, it's my understanding, you know, he's been in a wheelchair and different things. Uh, I have not read any of his writings, but after reading some of the comments that different ones have made, uh, I look forward to reading his writings. He was able to write songs and different things like that, but apparently very insightful. And um, he was one who did not allow his disease to get him down. One of the individuals that wrote about him was Max Dawson. And Max Dawson uh, knew uh, Matthew, which Matthew died at age 42 just like last week. Um, Max knew him from a time whenever he uh, first started his preaching or whatever. And he said about Matthew that he did not necessarily like cars. He said he didn't care whether a car was a Ford or a Buick or a Toyota or whether it looked good or whatever. As long as it got him from point A to point B, um, he was satisfied with that car. He didn't dislike a car. He didn't like a car. It was just one of those things of as long as it got him from A to B. And Max said, I was different. I was raised by a man who was a car guy. Uh, I was raised more or less in the shadows of the uh, Indianapolis Speedway. And uh, he said, I've probably been to the Indianapolis Speedway a hundred times without any exaggeration, both for time trials and uh, some of the pre-race type things and then the races themselves. Max just loved cars. Uh, and he liked to have shiny cars and things that made him look good and all that. But Matthew didn't. But the, the, the phrase that struck me the most at the very end was that he said, he's gone to a place where cars don't matter. I'll meet him soon. And I thought about that. You could put anything in there. He's gone to a place where farms don't matter, and I'll meet him soon. He's gone to a place where tractors don't matter, and I'll meet him soon. He's gone to a place where boats don't matter, and I'll meet him soon. He's gone to a place where houses don't matter, and I'll meet him soon. And anything you want to put in where bank accounts or, or where power or where governments or what, anything you want to put in there, he's gone to a place where that doesn't matter, and I'll meet him soon. And so as we think about those things, let's make sure that we don't get so caught up um, in the things of this world. I saw a cartoon just recently where that uh, somebody had, uh, it was like a native or something, had stolen a TV and he was running across this bridge and it said after he crossed the bridge he cut it off and he thought to himself, I have their idol now and, and I hope it'll bring me as much joy as it did them. Well, indicating that TV and things like that, computers, social media, has become an idol to a lot of people. They care a lot about that. They care about what other people say, and on and on it can go. We're going to a place where those things don't matter, and we're going to be there sooner than we think. So let's make sure that we think more about the things of heaven than we do about the things of this earth. If we can help you in that tonight, won't you come while together we stand and while we sing? Why
and uh, I'd like to ask if you could to come help set up for that and the building after services. Uh, Ronnie, would you lead us in a closing prayer? Don't forget about the time change Saturday night. Oh, yes, the time change is Saturday night also. <clears throat> God be with you till we meet again. Mark his counsels guide upon you. When his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet again.